Hey guys, how do you measure exogenous carbohydrate oxidation rates? And how do you read the results? In our previous video, we discussed uh, the basics of our recent publication where I measured exogenous carbohydrate oxidation rates during exercise. If you haven't checked that video out, I highly recommend you do that first. Um, because in this video, we're going to go a little bit more advanced and look at the underlying methodology. So how are exogenous carbohydrate oxidation rates measured and how do you actually read the data in the paper. So first we're gonna uh, discuss how uh, total carbohydrate oxidation rates are measured. Um, so this is uh, endogenous and exogenous carbohydrate oxidation rates combined. So glucose is uh, oxidized and then it forms carbon dioxide plus water. And oxidation is basically just a fancy way of saying uh, burnt for fuel. So here you see the molecular formula for these compounds. Uh, and uh, as you might remember from chemistry class, uh, the, um, the, uh, the atoms on the left side and on the right side have uh, to be the same. So on the left you see uh, C6, so six carbon atoms, which means that on the right side of the arrow there also needs to be six carbon atoms. So I've now uh, matched the whole uh, formula. And um, you see that when one uh, molecule of uh, glucose is uh, burnt, you use six oxygen and uh, uh, form six uh, uh, molecules of carbon dioxide and uh, six molecules of water. And with this, you can calculate the RER, so the respiratory exchange ratio, which is the... Uh, oxygen that you consume uh, divided by the carbon dioxide that you produce. So in this case, uh, 6 divided by 6 is 1. So an RER of 1 means that you're burning uh, only carbohydrates. Now you can do this same thing, uh, but rather than uh, glucose, you put uh, fat uh, in the formula. And you match it again and then you'll see that you get a value of 0.7 so 0.7 means that you're only burning fat as fuel and a value between 0.7 and 1 means that you're uh, burning a combination of fat and carbohydrates as fuel so here you see that by measuring uh, the oxygen that you consume and measuring the carbon dioxide that you produce you can calculate how much uh, uh, fat and carbohydrates uh, you burn during exercise. But um, if you measure the total amount of carbohydrates that you uh, burn dur during exercise, do you want that to be high or low? Because you want to separate exogenous and endogenous carbohydrate oxidation rates. So endogenous carbohydrate uh, oxidation rates is how much muscle glycogen and liver glycogen uh, are you burning as fuel and because you only have a limited storage capacity for these you want to uh, burn as little as uh, possible so you can keep going longer without needing them so uh, in contrast uh, your exogenous carbohydrate oxidation rates you want that as high as possible because how more uh, the more fuel you can burn from your sports rink for example the better it is the less you are uh, reliant on your endogenous fuel sources so how do we separate the endogenous and the exogenous carbohydrate oxidation rates so for this we need to introduce the concept of tracers so here you see the uh, molecular formula of glucose again and uh, so it has six carbon atoms and uh, carbon has a molecular weight of 12. However, uh, in nature, a very small percentage of all carbon atoms uh, has one additional neutron. And then it doesn't have a molecular weight of 12, but it has a molecular weight of 13. 
and these carbon atoms are functionally identical, so they do exactly the same thing. The only difference is that they weigh a little bit more. And because they weigh a little bit more, we can separate them. So we can measure, uh, um, for example, in a, in a bread sample, how much 12, uh, 12C carbon atoms are in it and how much 13C carbon atoms are in it. So here you see the formula again of carbohydrate oxidation. Um, but if we give a sport drink, for example, and uh, it has these 13C uh, carbon atoms in the glucose, then what happens, the glucose is oxidized and it produces CO2 again. But now the 13C atoms that were in the sport drink, in the, in the glucose from the sport drink, will end up in, uh, in the carbon dioxide. So the 13C goes from the glucose uh, to the 13 CO2 that is produced. So the 13 CO2 that is uh, produced, we can measure that in the breath that is uh, exhaled during exercise. And uh, this is a measurement of how much uh, uh, carbohydrates from your sport rank you are burning because the endogenous carbohydrates, so your muscle glycogen, for example, this will be regular glucose, so 12C glucose. So you know that if you measure 13 CO2 in the expired air, this uh, only reflects uh, the, the sport ring that you're burning, not your endogenous carbohydrate stores. So uh, this is a picture from uh, a recent paper where we uh, measured the 13 CO2 uh, enrichment in the breath. Don't pay too much attention to uh, the left axis. Um, the main thing here is what you see is that the, uh, the 13 CO2 enrichment increases in the three carbohydrate groups. Uh, of course, the water group um, only had water, so there were no 13 C labeled carbohydrates. So um, the value uh, uh, shouldn't increase. You see that it increases a little bit in the water group. And this is because, uh, as I said, a very small percentage of uh, the carbon atoms in nature are uh, 13C. So you always have a little bit of uh, 13C in your body. So um, you're burning a little bit of 13C uh, 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 yeah, carbon atoms during exercise just uh, from your muscle glycogen, but it is only a little bit compared to uh, the much higher values when you actually give uh, carbohydrates in a sport ring that have uh, a lot of these 13C atoms. So from this data, uh, you can calculate how much grams of uh, your sport ring you are actually burning. And that is this figure. Now, the first thing that you'll see is that uh, the water group has disappeared. Um, this is because uh, the water group uh, doesn't have any carbohydrates. So obviously you cannot burn any carbohydrates if, uh, uh, if, there, are, if there aren't any carbohydrates in the treatment. Uh, and the value that was used in our previous graph for the water is used as a background correction for the, uh, for the values uh, that you see in, in this figure. And you see that the glucose only group um, burns uh, about one gram of sport drink per minute. While if you have a combination of sugars, um, you can burn uh, approximately 40% uh, more of your sport drink. However, when you look at this figure, it appears that uh, it takes quite a while before uh, exogenous carbohydrate oxidation rates uh, start to get high. But that's actually not true. For that, I need to explain the bicarbonate buffer system. So when CO2 is produced by cells uh, together with water, uh, it will form uh, bicarbonate. So this one. So when uh, you give the 13C uh, carbohydrates, 13CO2 will be produced, but these 13C atoms uh, will be trapped, which is how we call it, as bicarbonate, which means that, um, yes, you are burning uh, carbohydrates, but 
the 13 C atoms don't appear in the bread right away because they are temporarily trapped in your blood. But as you see, there's also an arrow this way. So eventually a new equilibrium will exist where just as much uh, 13 CO2 will be uh, given from here back to, uh, to free form 13 CO2. So after a certain while, there's a new equilibrium where uh, the 13 CO2 in the bread will reflect the amount of uh, 13C that is produced by cells, but there's just a delay. So again, when you look here at the bread 13C enrichment, you see here that it takes quite a while um, before uh, the highest values are reached, but this is just an artifact. So if you look at the exogenous carbohydrate oxidation rates, uh, uh, your first uh, instinct might be, oh, it appears that maybe in the first uh, half hour of exercise, you don't really need to give uh, any sport drink because you won't burn them anyway. And then only after 60 minutes, maybe we should start ingesting carbohydrates at a, at a decent uh, rate. But this is actually not true. Uh, if you look at my manuscript, I talk a lot about the peak exogenous carbohydrate oxidation rate. So basically the highest value that you reach in uh, in a treatment and that value likely represents the true exogenous carbohydrate oxidation rate throughout exercise so this value the highest value is likely true for the the majority of exercise there might be a very small delay while the drink after ingestion has to go to your gut and has to be transported to the muscle but very early on uh, exogenous carbohydrate oxidation rates will uh, will be very high already so here uh, I see that, uh, I hope that you see that understanding the methods is pretty important because uh, the, the, the graph looks pretty straightforward, but you need to know a little bit about the backgrounds to have the proper interpretation. So I hope you liked the video. Um, if you have any questions, please ask them and I'll see you next time. And this is also what you see in uh in other studies, um, some, some actual training studies have been done where indeed people have trained for weeks and weeks and there you typically see that the longer rest periods groups uh, build a little bit more muscle.